special thanks to our sponsors, uh, the Political Science and International Relations Department, the International Relations and Political Science Association, and Democracy Matters. My name is Chet Gunther. I'm going to be your moderator tonight. I'm a freshman with uh, TRC Health studying international relations. I volunteer with NYPIRG, uh specifically in their, uh, in their campaigns to mobilize voters here in this region. Uh, over the last fall semester, NYPIRG, uh helped to register and turn out a record number of voters all across the state. And this event is our, is our movement to keep the momentum up for this semester. Before we get started, there's some things to clear up. There is a special election on April 30th for county executive. Uh, we encourage everyone to go out and vote for the candidate that best represents you in that election. However, that is not what tonight's event is about. Uh, this is about the village elections coming up on May 7th, uh, where you will be able to vote for village mayor and two of the, and vote for two out of the four candidates for the Board of Trustees. Uh, if you aren't registered to vote yet, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, we have a table set up at the back of the room, so after this is all done, uh, you can go ahead and register. All right, going through how this is going to work tonight, each candidate going in alphabetical order is going to give a three-minute introduction. Nick at the front uh, is going to give them a 10-second warning when they have 10 seconds left, a five-second warning when they have five seconds left and then cut them off uh, once the time is up. Uh, candidates, I ask that you please uh, respect the time so that we can get to as many audience questions at the end as we can. Uh, moving on from that, we have a few uh, predetermined questions uh, from NYPIRG and our co-sponsors uh, to ask the candidates. And once that is done, we'll be asking for questions from the audience. Every question, each candidate will have one minute to answer. Uh, we're going to be starting the questions in reverse alphabetical order and snake back and forth for the rest of the night. Does that make sense to everyone? Can everyone hear me in the back as well? I just want to make sure before we move on. Perfect. All right. Uh, we will be ending questions at 9.15 uh, in order to give every candidate a two-minute closing uh, statement as well. All right. Uh, so without further ado, our candidates tonight are incumbent trustee Don Kerr, uh, unchallenged mayor Tim Rogers, trustee challenger Alexandria Warwick, uh, incumbent trustee Dennis Young, and trustee challenger Michelle Zip. Don, you may begin your introduction. Thank you. So thanks everyone for being here. I want to thank the hosts for uh, the invitation. Yeah, it's very unusual to have a last name starts with K, and you're the first one in alphabetical uh, mm -hmm. order. I, I had thought we were coming into this election with a, a really diverse field of candidates, but the first ten letters of the alphabet are really underrepresented at this table. <laughs> I'd like all the candidates to join me in, in knowing they support the first ten letters of the alphabet. Um, yeah, my, my dad was an immigrant to this country, and that's one of the reasons the uh, plight of uh, Luis Martinez strikes so strongly with me. Um, some people express their patriotism by joining the military. That's, that's a fine way. But I express my patriotism by serving in public office. I was a high school a PTSA officer, board of education officer, and a village trustee. I've also been active uh, throughout my, my adult life. I'm proud to be part of this board. Um, we purchased the Millbrook Preserve, protected tenants in this community, reduced our dependence, and are reducing our dependence on New York City uh, for the water we drink, uh, we're moving toward uh, community choice aggregation, and we've moved this community forward in so very many ways. Uh, individually, I have been a fierce protector of the Millbrook Preserve. I am a leader in the effort to protect the Walk Hill River. Um, I helped to put in place the ban on plastic retail bags, and I helped to celebrate, celebrate diversity in our community by that rainbow crosswalk, which will be repainted soon. Uh, before the uh, the Pride March. I've also been a leader and continue to lead in the effort to pair four-story buildings with mass transit in this community. When this community has rallied or protested uh, for Luis, 
I have generally been there with a camera in hand. Uh, I've been asked by the board to look into and, and uh, advise them on waste to energy, turning methane gas into electricity at our wastewater plant. And something that's rather unique, uh, years ago, uh, I was falsely arrested. And it cost me my job as school board president. Um, over the past year, I've worked with and negotiated the New Pulse Police with the New Pulse Police Department, whom I sued, and successfully come up with some real progress in how they enforce the marijuana laws. The next meeting, I'm going to be proposing a plastic ban, plastic a ban on plastic straws in our community. Uh, I'm approachable to everyone. You know, we have a majority on, on our board who often sees things the same way. And uh, most of our votes are five no, five five nothing. But I often ask the devil's advocate questions and look at things in ways that others have not. And it's diversity in, in how we look at things that often makes this board so effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. <coughs> So my name, my name is Tim Rogers. I've been the uh, village mayor since May of 2015. In 2015, um, what's interesting about New York state law and villages is that you can't run as a, a major party candidate. You can't be a Democrat or a Republican or a Green. Um, you have to come up with your own name. So the, the name that I chose for, for my party at that time was the everyday party. And my thinking was um, that and that's two words, not every day one word, which would be boring, but uh, or, or just overly conventional. But so every day, my plan would be to show up for work and work on lots of important stuff. Because you know, as Don pointed out, you know, there's there's a, a number of things that you know we get to work on as as members of uh, of the village board, for instance. But I think what's unique and special about New Paltz is that most of us have shared political sensibilities, um, whether it's the Rainbow Crosswalk or memorializing resolutions about ICE or you know big national issues, but also important local issues like how do we make sure that we're sourcing more water locally. Um, the, the challenge that, that we have is you know being a bureaucratic entity and actually just getting things done, and that's why I chose the idea of running as the everyday party because I feel like the only way to get stuff done uh, when you're part of a bureaucracy is to just chip away and do work incrementally. And I, I feel like that's, that's how I was trained. Um, when I worked in finance, I, I you know, had to be relentless and push projects through and that's the same skill set that's needed to to do the type of work that we do here. You know, we've been constructing a firehouse for four years. We've been working to source more water locally for four years. And we're doing really cool, important, interesting stuff. Um, but none of that stuff happens at the board table. It happens by being in the office every day, by following up um, with various folks who are involved. And um, you know that's that's what I want to continue to do is just keep working hard. Uh, I, I feel super fortunate that I get to do this type of work because I find it to be really interesting. Like people tease me, like, "Oh wow, you're going back to the office to look at, you know, you know several years of back data regarding uh, quarterly sales tax in this community." I'm like, "Heck yeah!" Like I think that stuff is fascinating because I think it's really interesting to see how we actually pay for stuff in our community. You know whether it's through property taxes or sales tax. So I want to continue to do that everyday type of work. Thank you very much, Tim. Alex. Closer. Okay. Hey everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here, watching. Um, if you're watching after the fact, and a special thanks for Nyperk for putting this together. Um, in the words of President Obama, "I'm a perg guy. They taught me well." Um, because Nyker taught me everything I know. Um, so, yeah, I'm Alexandra Wojcik. Thank you um, for getting it kind of close. Uh, but you can call me Alex. I prefer she, her, they, them pronouns. Um, and for those who don't already know me, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I have spent my entire life working and fighting in the public interest as an activist, an organizer, and a public servant. 
Um, since moving to New York in 2003 for college, I've been an active and aware member of our community in a variety of ways. I am a self-proclaimed fairy of social justice, always prepared with voter registration forms, my clipboard, um, and some eco glitter, um, and always bringing the organizing that we see in the daylight, um, daytime, into the margins of our community who make up our vibrant nightlife scene. So um, a lot of voters in our community like know me more recently as like the uh, campaigner who basically called every single day asking, please knock on a few more doors for Delgado or Senator Metzger or any other candidate. Um, but I, I just want to throw it out there that I've been uh, doing that kind of work for a lot, lot longer um, than that. So one of my very first acts for our community was actually co-founding this campus's recycling program, um, which um, I'm so proud of. You know, every time I walk onto campus, you know, I see some of my old very bad clip art signs. I'm like, oh, those are awesome. Um, so that's probably one of my proudest things. I've been an on and off active member of the Climate Action Coalition. Um, I was a lead organizer of the People's Climate March on the walkway over the Hudson a few years back. That was the largest sister solidarity event of its kind in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, because climate, uh, climate justice is probably the most intersectional issue that we can think of, my activism doesn't end there. Um, I fight on the daily, on the front lines of today's uh, feminist movement. Some know me as the original uh, leader of Slut Halt, the organization known for the annual uh, March Against Rape Culture. Um, I'm also a co-founder of uh, March on Hudson Valley, which is a proud affiliate of the international organization March On. I'm a regular at Food Not Bombs, um, and I represent District 9, which is campus on the town Democratic Committee. And that's a little bit of what I do um, and what I will continue to bring to the community you know no matter what the outcome is on May 7th you know I've been walking the walk all along um, and I'm asking for you know everyone's support so I can bring all that I've seen heard and experienced uh, to the public policy process um, so it's funny uh, just hearing you know all these folks talking before me with, uh, without taking notes because I used to uh, clerk for the village board. So um, I, I started writing all over everything before. Um, so I do have like the experience it takes to do the job, just like an incumbent might, and thanks so much for having us. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having us. And uh, hi, I'm Dennis Young, village trustee, uh, father to a local kindergarten student, and I was elected four years ago alongside Tim and Don, and I have notes too, Alex. Uh, so when I ran for office, my big goal was to change the way that uh, garbage was hauled in our community by changing to a single hauler uh, plan. And the, uh, the stated intent was to reduce costs for residents while lowering our carbon footprint. It was an ambitious goal, as others had tried and failed to do this in the past, but four years later, we now have a single hauler law and less trucks polluting our environment. Uh, side note, the average garbage truck produces an average of 186,000 pounds of carbon dioxide per year, so with this change, we actually drastically reduce the carbon footprint of the garbage collection process in the village. In my day job, I am a successful business professional. I spend most of my time building relationships with potential business partners and then negotiating high dollar contracts with those potential business partners. Uh, real world skills are a key to lasting success in this role and I believe that leveraging these skills is why we were able to successfully issue an RFP for the single hauler when others had failed. I've also written an RFP to replace the aging playground at Hasbro Park and I'm currently writing my third RFP for sidewalk uh, snow removal. I'm also currently working on proposed code changes for an overlay zone that would encourage greener building standards, additional affordable housing units, and money to help solve our infrastructure needs. In my time as a trustee, I also helped to restart the previously defunct Landlord-Tenant Relations Council, and I've served as the Village Board Liaison to that council uh, during my tenure, and there's definitely a lot more work that needs to be done as far as protecting tenants' rights and educating tenants about their rights and to help fight back for their rights. I'm currently working on legislation that would disincentivize illegal landlord entries, and I'm also looking into how we can make it easier to hold absentee landlords accountable in our community. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is uh, when our landlords live elsewhere, they're required to be taken to court in that other municipality, which doesn't seem right. If you live here and you're renting here, you should be able to hold the landlord accountable in our community. So. Um, 
By the way, we're also looking for two more tenant representatives on the Landlord Tenant Relation Council. If anybody's interested, we would love to have some more young voices on the council. Uh, contact the village clerk for more information. You can see me after the event. I'm Dennis Young, and that's why I'm running for re-election. Thanks. Thank you very much. Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Zipp. Um, my involvement in our community as an organizer and advocate for the underserved has inspired me to further this path by running for Village Board this year. In 2017, I founded Resisterhood New Paltz. We're a small warrior group of women who resist against injustices and negativity affecting us all with positive action and initiatives. In December of 2008, Resisterhood expanded to create Resisterhood Choir with the same mission through song. We are voices of equality and empowerment. Being a part of Resisterhood allows me to look for ways to help our community. Our annual Red Tent Drive, which is highly successful, collects feminine hygiene products for distribution by family of New Paltz. To date, we've collected over 9,000 maxi pads and tampons. And our After Me Too forum focused on empowerment after trauma with the expertise of trauma therapists. We hosted a congressional forum for all District 19 candidates, the only forum focused on women's issues, and held a community potluck with the aim of coming together to build trust within our community. So I really care about finding solutions to common problems and affecting change. It's why I do all that I do. I'm also an alumna of SUNY New Paltz. I earned my BA in English in 1988. After graduating, I moved to Brooklyn and worked as an editor and writer in New York City. Most notably, I launched the website Cafe Mom 10 years ago. I've written articles for various publications advocating for women's rights, equality, better environmental practices, and to shine a light on injustices far too long overlooked. I'm also a wedding officiant, Reiki master, postpartum doula, and I'm a single mom, so I need a flex schedule, and this is the outcome. I wouldn't have it any other way. I've learned so much in all I've done. In 2014, I returned to New Paltz with my children to grow roots, and since moving back, I also served as an alternate on the planning board. Um, I really want to seek more ways for affordable housing, decrease the cost of living in our village, keeping an eye on the tax burden, I'm committed to exploring more ways to get school-age kids involved in local politics and investigate or offering childcare during board meetings so more parents can attend. I've lived the need for better options for renters in our village. We should also have better opportunities for those who want to become homeowners. I was a renter for most all of my life, and I'm also low income. But through tight budgeting, saving, I was able to purchase a townhome for my kids and I three years ago. So I believe in really creating pathways for our residents, from the youngest to the oldest, to have a better life here in our village. I believe together we can accomplish these needs if we collaborate and talk openly. And the underlying theme for me is love, compassion, caring about others, listening and executing best next steps. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite up uh, Alicia Ortiz uh, to ask a question on behalf of NIPA. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, as Chet said, my name is Alicia Ortiz. I'm currently a senior here at SUNY New Pulse, and I'm going to ask the first question. So as we all know, New Paltz is a predominantly white community. However, the number of students of color increases each year, making us a driving force in the economy of the village. What the students of New Paltz want to know is what will you, as an elected official, do to make sure our students are not targeted for the color of their skin, for smoking pot, protecting us against police brutality, and to ensure that we are welcomed by all local businesses. Um, thank you for your question. I think we need to listen to each other. I think we need to create better ways of communication so we're all understanding exactly 
what each person is feeling in order to move forward into the best next steps. Um, part of the work I've done with Resisterhood is exactly that, looking at those who have been underserved in our community and figure out ways, how, what can we do? And the way to do that is really to have open communication, to talk and understand each other, and so we can move forward in the best possible next steps. Good question. So um, one of the things that our village board has explored is, uh, in relation to specifically mentioned pot, uh, the way that uh, marijuana is ticketed in our community is one of the things that we're looking at uh, to try and make it uh, so it's not as uh, burdensome for people that get ticketed for uh, a, something that shouldn't be a crime, quite frankly. Uh, being welcome at local businesses, that's the kind of thing, um, and recently, there was uh, somebody, a big explosion on Facebook because a local business had a very hateful thing posted in their door. I had people that I know from other communities reaching out to me because uh, they were very offended and they looked to New Paltz as a very progressive leadership type of place. And it comes down to uh, the community because uh, we can't go burn down the, the, the establishment, but as a community, we can all rally against each other and. Uh, rally around each other and not uh, as not go to that establishment anymore. We can make sure our voices are heard as consumers. Um, so let's call it what it is. You know, how are we going to fight white supremacy um, if elected? Um, so you know, obviously we need system change instead of climate change. Um, and I believe that so so called best practices are what got us here today. Um, so we need to get away from whatever those best practices are and um, just in general just being a fresh um, you know fresh voice fresh person you know um, coming from you know just a totally different you know background um, different generation um, I, I think could help just you know uh, make it more of an open uh, open space and a safe space um, for people who are marginalized um, you know people of color um, and other marginalized groups. And let's face it, it all does go back to climate change. You know, we're all gonna be climate refugees, but who's going to struggle the most? People of color um, and, you know, low-income folks, um, you know, renters and so on down the line. So continuing to stand up for all that I've stood up for all my life, I think um, we'll continue to fight white supremacy. So uh, it's obviously, overt white supremacy is a problem, but it's also our, our biases that many of us don't realize that we have. Um, one of the things that we've been doing as a joint town and village board is taking a closer look at, you know, are there programs that we could invest in as a community? We've been doing this uh, also with the school district, like, you know, could there be like uh, racial equity sensitivity training? Like one of my best friends from college is a pretty successful documentary filmmaker. He made the film Prep School Negro and I'm Not a Racist, Am I? And he's working with an organization that trains, you know, large companies and governments and, you know, all of us as public officials, um, you know, probably would benefit from that type of training. Our police force would benefit from that type of training. And I don't think there's any one simple solution. It's probably lots of different things that we need to be doing. So we're, we're trying to approach it from several different angles. Well, you touched on a couple, <coughs> a couple of areas where I've been particularly active. Uh, I mentioned that I had been uh, falsely arrested, and I spent the last year working with the New Post Police Department local attorneys, uh, representatives of the district attorney's office, to try to <coughs> reform the marijuana laws so that if someone was caught uh, smoking weed in a parking lot, they wouldn't be hauled off to, to a court. They wouldn't be handcuffed. They'd be given a ticket in an envelope where they could mail in their fine. And I think a lot of careers uh, would be less negatively affected if that were in place. Uh, I was pretty uh, distraught in watching the, um, the meetings of the town board in response to uh, an ind individual being uh, um, bloodied and, and uh, beat up in the back of a police car. Um, in response, I volunteered and I have an application to be in front of the Citizens Advisory Commission uh, to the police department. That's real action, not words. So another issue I would like to touch on um, tonight that was mentioned earlier is in regards to tenants' rights. 
So personally, I've lived off campus for a while now, and um, I've never heard of the Landlord-Tenant Relations Council until I um, looked it up. So I want to know what you guys can do to make sure meetings and councils such as these are more publicized and open to the public if that's possible. Any well, I'm a, I'm a renter myself. I've rented an office space in uh, New Paltz for many, many years. Uh, I had uh, recently had a move because my landlord asked me to raise the rent twice within six months. Um, you know, people, people face those sorts of things. I think uh, I'd like to give a shout out to, uh, to Katie and Dennis who have started having meetings of the Tenant Relations Committee uh, here on, on campus. Every other meeting is now happening on campus so that it can be a part of the culture here and, and, and access can be easy. And I think that's one of the, you know, it, that wasn't my, my action, it was by, by some of my colleagues, but I think it's an effective one in response to your question. Um, the reason I ran for this job four years ago is because I was really discouraged with what I saw from our building department. I think a great way to protect tenants is to have an empowered building department and we've, we've done that by restructuring and hiring some, some folks who are making sure that the inspections of rental properties are being done thoroughly and correctly. Because what we've seen over time is you know, a fair number of, of absentee landlords and income investors who generally take advantage of the fact that you know, we have you know, young people who are primarily focused on getting their degree and, and uh, you know, might be unfamiliar with, with some of their rights. And you know, I think it's the responsibility of the, the local government to make sure that we have robust en enforcement and inspection mechanism. So I'm super proud of the, the changes that we've made to our building department and we still have a long way to go. And you know, one thing that we can do is just make sure that everyone's aware of which properties are registered, which is a requirement by law, and we're making sure that that's available online so anyone can look at it very, very easily. Sorry. I owe you five seconds. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so a uh, fellow, you know, lifelong renter right here um, who actually uh, went through in, an eviction last year here, here in town. Um, I, uh, rather against my own, like, self-care, uh, tried to fight it uh, for, for, for months and months and months, uh, despite living last winter um, with no heat or hot water right here in the village. And um, what, what I learned from that was, was you know, that no, no matter how you cut it, the, the system is rigged against you um, unless you're not already in the cycle of poverty um, and you're like a rich renter or something. You know, the system is rigged. Um, and it is really hard to find out how to navigate the system, like even when you work in the village, like I did at the time. Like I couldn't figure out, you know, all the bits and pieces. It took a lot of people helping me um, and whatnot. And eventually, um, you know, of course, the eviction wound up going through. So I would do my best to do, you know, old school grassroots, you know, organizing to get people like to know about things like the Landlord Tenant Relations Council um, and, and, you know, how to go through with eviction proceedings and whatnot. I owe you three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be time rich by the end of this debate. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I did previously mention the Landlord Tenant Relations Council. Uh, as the oldest child of a single parent, I have rented or watched my mother rent uh, for most of my life, other up until I actually became a, a homeowner myself after I was able to save money like Michelle did. Um, the Landlord Tenant Relation Council met in this very room last month where I helped give a presentation with the chair of the council on different tenant rights and uh, just trying to get the word out there. Education is a big piece of what we do. We're actually going to be back here a week from today. It's going to be in a different room because this room is occupied. SA offices for the 19. Right. So we'll be back on campus uh, next week. It's. Uh, We've been creating promotional materials just to try and help educate people about their rights and specifically about what's different in New Paltz, such as you can contact our building department to find out about the status of rental inspection and our security deposit. <coughs> um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of work. Uh, the biggest thing that with tenants is trying to find tenants that are willing to fight back against landlords and hold them accountable because bringing them to court is the only way we're going to be able to change outcomes. Um, side question, do you know the exact day 
date of that meeting? It's next Thursday night, 7 o'clock. The student affairs room is that? SA right? uh, office is 419. 25th. Thank you so much. Thank you. And since you mentioned you're a renter, I did mention we're looking for more people to represent our tenants on the landlord tenant relation council. We've thrown it out there, even at the cost of another 15 seconds. <laughs> Um, I, I, my, the first seven years of my kid's life, we lived in seven different apartments. So, you know, this is a huge thing. We had to move for various different reasons. I've taken landlords to court. This, like, to echo what Alex said, the system is rigged against tenants. I mean, the, the landlords do have the power, and we need to empower tenants to just have more ability to feel comfortable in speaking out and knowing that they have people behind them to help them through any process because it can be very confusing and daunting and feeling like you're going to lose your money and have to spend money. So I think, you know, in order to get these, um, your question specifically was, and how can we make sure everybody is on the same page? I think we need to blast social media. We need to make sure everybody knows what's going on at these meetings. We need these meetings to be recorded so people can have that information and also just find more ways to have more fluidity in the conversation back and forth. Thanks. Thank you. So my last question is going to be in regards to um, how the village can work with the school and local businesses in town to get rid of plastic straws. <laughs> I can start with that. Yeah, if you if you're ready. To. So um, the uh, the New Paltz High School students recently approached the the town and village board and got the ball rolling with a resolution that the town and village board adopted, um, where all businesses are are asked. Because this is not a law, um, because a law would take a few more steps. But I think this was an important first step, you know, as far as awareness. So if you're at a restaurant, instead of automatically being served a drink with a straw, you would be served a drink without a straw, and then the only way to get a straw is to ask. Um, so moving forward, you know, we definitely have to consider whether, um, you know, per, per, uh, pursuing legislation which would ban straws, you know, that. You know, as Don pointed out, is being considered by the uh, Environmental Policy Board, and uh, the Village Board will then have to decide what the next steps are. Okay. Yeah. So I like to get rid of plastic um, in every which way and form. Like I, I do think it, it has to be done legislatively. Um, because that's the only way you also address, um, you know, folks with disabilities who do need to have straws and, and whatnot. Um, you know, so you need to kind of create like a mechanism that makes it so it's like we're not like automatically all getting plastic straws, but those who like need access to them like still can get it. Um, you know, and whatnot. One thing I've noticed is like how hard it is to find um, the reusable straws. Like um, I like I. I just, whenever I see them, like I buy them and then I have them on hand. But I think um, we would also need to kind of encourage um, finding other ways to, to have reusable straws available. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of um, legislation kind of popping up on the state level uh, to address our, you know, addiction to plastics overall. Um, and I think, you know, looking, looking at that um, and seeing how we can like strengthen that um, and, and make it more of like, again, a partnership um, would, would make a lot of sense. So, uh, just to echo the sentiments uh, that have already been said, it absolutely has to be done legislatively to to effectively do this. You know, I was really excited when we uh, moved forward with the memorial uh, resolution that was brought forth by the college by, by high school students. But unfortunately, I go out to eat and I constantly get served drinks with straws. I never get asked, so it's not working. And we need to do more. We need to do something legislatively, and we need to get rid of straws. And you can get your time back. Um, cur currently in uh, Resistorhood New Paltz, which I am co-founder, we are having the zero plastic challenge. 
So it's, we've had it for the whole month of April and it's really looking at ways on how we can reduce our plastic usage because when you really take a moment and look at how much plastic you, lose, you use, it's, it's overwhelming. And so I think straws are one way, but I also, to echo what Alex said, we really need to have straws available for the, the disabled because they're very needed for that as well. Um, but yes, I agree. We need to find these ways to trim back, and we also need to do it legislatively, and also look at um, how can we hold the big companies accountable? How can we force their hand to, to say we need to make a change, and perhaps the plastic companies will therefore make a change, the companies that produce the most plastic. So it's really looking at those big name companies as well to helping, making a statement to force that change as well. Thank you. I'm wondering, is there someone locked in the closet back there? I'm curious. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a dance club. Okay. They're okay. scheduled for 8 o'clock. We like dance. Uh, yeah, there, there are other straws that have been plastic. Uh, I've been to uh, restaurants where they have, uh, have paper straws, and they, they biodegrade in uh, less than a thousand years, so that might be a better option. I mentioned earlier that I would be proposing at the next meeting a ban on plastic straws. Um, I helped to bring forward the ban on plastic retail bags, and I think we had some discussion at the last uh, village board meeting that the new state law on plastic bags may actually supersede our law and may actually force us to allow retail bags in restaurants again. I'm not quite sure if that's exactly how it'll wash out, but it, it, it kind of makes my head explode. We're trying to move forward, and the state has this great, great ban, but there's so many loopholes in it, you can drive three trucks through them. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that they may drag us backwards in new bolts. But uh, banning uh, straws seems like a, a, a doable thing. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to have some questions from the audience. I believe there's no cards being passed around. So if you could just write down the question. We can or we can just raise hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. So, yes, we'll start doing audience questions. If you have a question, please just raise your hand, um, and we'll try to make sure we get to everyone. Yes. So, the, the decision to move to a single garbage pickup you know, system for the entire village, I think it's a smart idea. The thing that I'm worried about is that, you know, I understand a lot of residents are, you know, concerned that, you know, the company that is picked, you know, is going to, you know, is, is, is going to hike rates, is going to make things difficult, they're not going to do their job properly, and that's why they like the multiple company system, they like being able to choose. So, I'm, I'm just curious, like, how you would, you know, step in and, you know, enforce whatever you need to enforce, uh, you know, in case the company that picks up garbage for everybody, you know, decides to, you know, play unfairly. Would anyone like to start with that one? It's possible. Awesome. Okay. I mean, we have a form about anyone but near death. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the garbage man, so I guess we can start with that. Uh, right now, at, at the contract that we have with County Waste, <coughs> this was a publicly bid project. Uh, the monopoly word gets thrown around. But this was a publicly bid project. That contract has certain uh, commitments that County Waste is uh, obligated to uphold. If they're not upholding their commitments, we have a ways to hold them accountable. Uh, there's mechanisms we notify them if it's not being done. We can get out of the contract if they're not holding up their part of the weight. But more than half the country has a single garbage hauler in their community. Uh, prior to the single hauler initiative, the town didn't have any permitting process at all. The village had a permitting process for residential collection, but the town had none. Anybody that wanted to pick up garbage, nobody was checking to see if we even had a permit uh, with the county to collect garbage. This is such a huge step in the right direction uh, environmentally, and by bidding together, my bill went down almost $13 a month. That's huge savings when people talk about affordability and new costs. Which way do we pass? Uh, yes. Um, pass to the left. Um, I mean, I'm a huge proponent of the single hauler. It's great environmentally for noise pollution as well as saving money. So I think it's, it really is just all about being holding these companies, the company accountable and just following up on that and just staying on task with them for any, if there are any issues, um, the community can share any issues and I believe they, they certainly have been as well. 
Um, but overall, I think the initiative is, is excellent and it's definitely moving in the right direction for us as a community. <coughs> Um, I, give, uh, you know, I, give, I give props to uh, Dennis Young, who actually got this issue across the finish line. This was initially a proposal of Mayor Jason West in his first term. Um, and I recall uh, being in meetings at that time, and we were looking at the prospect of doing a trash inventory, which sounds really cool, but it means you have to get in a week's worth of trash and sort it out and figure out what's being thrown away. Uh, no one really volunteered for that particular task. Um, but I, I think... Uh, there are concerns that have been stated, you know, is the, the single hauler really recycling all that they should be? And the Environmental Policy Group is going to be doing a tour of the recycling facility that County Waste uses up in Albany. And, and they've welcomed us. Uh, so they, they say they've got nothing to hide. And you know, you've, got to, you've got to trust in that. But as, as Dennis said, there are mechanisms. If they screw up, we have the, we have the opportunity and the full right to, uh, to pull the plug and assign that work to someone else. Yeah, I, I would add, um, so Dennis and I reached out to County Waste a while ago. He wasn't able to attend uh, because of work, but myself and the town supervisor visited County Waste's $50 million municipal recovery facility. And I actually left that facility somewhat encouraged because um, single stream feels a little bit ridiculous. You throw all this recyclable stuff into a, a single bin and then you, you you got to believe that it's getting separated and recycled. Um, the difference between, and, and this is another reason why I think using a large private company, this is an example of the private sector doing it better than the public sector, because in Albany, that MRF uh, handles 500 tons of recyclables per day, whereas the um, MRF in Ulster County uh, handles less than 2,000 tons per month. So the volume that's being, uh, this is a really cool point, I want to share this with the group. <laughs> so, like, we've all seen articles about how, like, things are not getting recycled because, like, China is not interested in buying our recyclables. So the county waste facility was buying basically everything that we could sell except for paper. And then what they, what they did uh, as a MRF is they invested $4 million in a, an, an optical scanner so that they could separate paper and then create bales of paper then sell it locally. So I think there is, a, there is an advantage to using a BMOF in certain situations. And sometimes the private sector gets it right because they're motivated to sell their recyclables, and um, it's not a perfect system. You know, like shredded paper does not get recycled. Lots of other things. I was blown away that glass does not get recycled at MRFs. Um, there's really like, if you're buying a plastic water bottle, it's probably better than buying a glass uh, water bottle. Tim's going to write you a check for two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, obviously as an environmentalist, I'm all about getting, you know, less uh, trucks off the streets. Um, uh, but as a renter, I do want to point out that all the savings uh, tend not to trickle down to, to those of us, you know, rent is what it is, um, regardless what landlord's paying or not paying um, for, for trash pickup. Um, so one thing I've noticed um, in my time when I was, you know, clerking for this crew um, and in other positions I've held, um, that people just don't really understand the processes of, of these different things. And I think uh, one way to kind of get a, get ahead of, you know, the issues that the community is seeing, like with, you know, the trash system, is to just find different ways to do to be more creative with outreach to tell people what an RFP process is and whatnot. And um, you know, when, when, if they have problems with that process, that's an attorney general question. It has nothing to do with any of these guys. Um, so just being more clear about the, the procedures and stuff, I think would help, you know, uh, people feel like more like in on it, um, get total buy-in. Um, of course, personally, I think it'd be really great, um, if we could have our own municipal program, but we are a tiny little place, so not going to happen. All right. Thank you very much. Um, should, it, should we extend the time to a minute and a half and then help everyone? I think, uh, Would that yeah. be a good idea? I think okay. Uh, All right. Well, we'll, 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 we'
Okay, so a minute and a half for each question. Now on. Uh, you, sir. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I have a question that um, I'm a former resident of the village, and I always felt that the noise ordinances were um, criminalizing somewhat behavior that's normal, like enjoying music at night and wanting to have concerts. <laughs> it's a very vibrant um, music scene in this town, and it was definitely an important part of my time as a student here. I was wondering if the candidates could speak to either eliminating or changing those noise ordinance laws or um, creating an alternative space that, this is a crazy idea, but either the village and the school could perhaps collaborate to fund a project to have a space so instead of you know people having to have shows in their basements, provide an alternative for local musicians to say, here's a space you can go that won't bother anyone, um, and funding it so that it would be um, run efficiently and not, not just a, a, a worse alternative than being in the basements. I could start with this one. Um, awesome question, Eli. So um, that brings up my favorite like court case. Uh, uh, it was Ward versus Rock and Racism in like the '80s in New York City. And basically, what came out of that it was like a noise ordinance thing was um, that the city would provide the soundboards for for organizations and and bands and stuff, and basically. Uh, provide the sound um, in, in the park, which is really cool. And I agree. Um, you know, I spent a lot of my nights in, in basements um, here here in New Paltz, and it's great. I love our DIY scene. I live for it. But also, um, there's nothing worse and more scary than, you know, when a, a noise complaint gets called in, you're in a basement. You know, how do you get out? Um, we do need more space. Um, and I think that would be, like, the best solution. Um, so, uh, way back in the day, Earth Day Fest held in Hasbrook Park uh, with Nyperg and whatnot. I'll never forget, you know, I had worked really hard as a student to get all these different bands to come, you know, into town to, to help tout, you know, all the different issues that we were fighting for on the environmental front. And it was in the middle of the day that, like, the cops came. Um, it was, like, spring 2004. And it was, like, I was mortified. I was, like, I'm so sorry. Um, because, you know, we were setting up our own sound in Hasbrook Park and, like, kind of having a space that is, you know, a municipal space, um, maybe shared with the college, I think would get around all these different types of issues, and it would also address just the safety issues of all of our basement DIY scenes. Um, there's nothing worse also than organizing an event in town and also having to deal with the noise ordinance um, issues there, um, and it happens all the time, and that's why different bands are going to Kingston instead, um, and people, you know, are migrating out um, and, and not keeping the art right here in the community. Good question. I think uh, noise needs to be decriminalized, much like marijuana to an extent, but at the same time, we need to make sure that people are also being good neighbors. I, you know, uh, my son's six now. Uh, when he was a baby, I routinely had to go across the street and politely ask neighbors, you know, to not make so much noise. I wasn't calling the police, but I still had to go over there. It's, you know, this community is shared by a wide variety of people, and it's shared. It has to be shared respectfully, and communication is the key to doing that. So yes, I do think we can legislatively have room to move with our noise ordinances, uh, but it, it really just comes down to being a good neighbor as well. As a parent of nine-year-old twins who have to get up early for school, I'm, you know, that nerd who goes to bed kind of early. Um, I live in Briarwood townhouses too, so we have a, a mix of students and um, retirees and people of all ages that live there. And we've, we've got a great thing going because we all respect each other, generally, and you know, if there is noise, it's okay to go knock on the door and there, people are like, oh, sorry, I'll... So I think really communicating with our, our, our neighbors um, is important, but I also think there needs to be more um, alternative spaces. I was bummed when the old Barnabys became a church, no, no offense to the church, but that would make it an amazing venue. Um, I also, there's recently <coughs> something that opened up um, in the city and it's a, a non-alcoholic space for people to just enjoy art and music 
And I think that's something that our town could really be enriched by and, and would be a place that takes the alcohol out of, out of, we have so many bars, right? So we don't really need another bar. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a space that is focused on art and music and celebrating exactly that and being together with your community? Um, so I think more alternative spaces is something that would be great and to move forward and to make everyone happy and good neighbors. You know, I think the uh, I think law enforcement would probably agree. Noise ordinances are really a really rough idea. How do you enforce them? We've had so many different approaches in this community. Do we use decibel meters? Do we, you know, what kind of standards do we use? And it's it's really difficult to uh, uh, to enforce. And I, I agree, civility and, and just being a good neighbor is probably the best uh, the best solution. Um, I think it's about four years ago there was a group of um, a, a group of young people who were feeling very plugged out and very ignored, and they had something to say musically. And so I sponsored a, a rap concert in Hasbro Park. And um, it only took about two hours, but the, uh, the police did show up. And uh, the most memorable thing about that, and it was pointed out to me after the police left, they took three names and, and addresses out of the 10 performers or so. And it was the three people of color. Um, so I, I hear you. I don't have a magic bullet. It's a rough issue, but uh, I, I'm very sympathetic to the uh, to the people who are concerned about that. You, are you gonna answer? Oh, you still answer I don't know if you wanted to ask something specific. I'm gonna ask. I, I was gonna ask question. a question. You could just yeah. switch. Um, so one thing that was changed um, within the recent past regarding the noise ordinance um, was to make the landlords more accountable and not just put it on the individual uh, individuals. So like if there are properties that are basically like party houses or repeat offenders, like the, the landlords also have a responsibility to work with, to, to work with and, and manage their tenants. Um, you know, what's super challenging, I think a number of folks said this um, in response to this question is like, What's special and unique about New Paltz is that this is uh, a mixed community with residents who have different schedules. There, you know, will be young people and families and older people who don't want any noise. But you know, I also appreciate when you know the weather gets nice and you hear people out and about, and there may be a, you know some amplified music in someone's backyard because I live here because it is uh, a college town. I mean, I think that vibrancy is important and valuable and, and um, often the police are showing up not because uh, they feel that noise is being too loud, they're responding to other folks who are complaining. So our police are, are not you know, perfect but they do a, a decent job of trying to recognize that you know, there's different folks with different needs and sometimes they get it wrong but you know, I give our, our um, Police Lieutenant Rob Lucchese a great deal of credit. You know, he's making an active effort to hire, you know, this gets back to your question from earlier, you know, to hire some, uh, make sure that we have representation in the force with, with uh, folks of color. And, um, you know, I think all things considered, it's a, it's a pretty solid police department. They can always strive to do better, but um, it's, it's a challenging, nuanced, nuanced job. Great, thank you very much. I skipped over you two last time. So. Oh. Um, so I just wanted to ask another question about tenants' rights. Um, I think everyone had a great, very similar answer, but I think a unique problem students have is we're often 10-month lease renters, and then we're returning to our parents for three months, which means coming back and fighting landlords in court about security deposits is like a unique issue where you're commuting or there, there's some there's some type of difference in the court system, like it's just not as easy as, you know, someone who's living up here full time. And I'm also thinking that it is important for tenants to go to court, but that maybe there should be things in the way of having to go to court. I mean, if that makes sense, like I, I've just found my experience with all the times I've been renting in New Paltz have been like pretty atrocious and I just wish there would be more things to like stop that from happening instead of me having to go to court to solve that and I am pro going to court, but if anyone has any more specific ideas about 
I don't know, implementing systems before. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you can talk about like a, you know, our security deposit law, right? And we tried to disincentivize uh, bad landlords from keeping security deposits for too long or not giving them back at all. Well, tenants have to take them to court to get the reward. There's no mechanism. Like we can't have the village board just say, hey, landlord, write them a check. There has to be process involved. So we can try and create process that's as easy as possible for tenants, but we still have to, we need tenants that are willing to stand up for themselves as well to try and change behaviors of landlords because only when they go to court and have to pay that amount and that extra penalty enough times are they going to stop what they're doing. Right, so I'm thinking, sorry, just quickly, no, no, uh, I, the penalty is pretty low right now, what is it, 25? The judge has the, the ability to do three times damages, or three times what's owed. It's okay. the judge's discretion. Right, so whatever's with, with help, they could triple it. You know, there's a very large financial penalty but you have to be willing to take them to court. I was always under the impression it's 25 percent. That's the minimum. Okay. Right. No. Okay. So I think you know there's there's no perfect solution to, to fixing this, but I think the the fact that we created this security deposit law actually kind of like frames the issue, and I think it should empower tenants, and um, it should also help to, as a reminder for landlords too, like. You know, we've created some boundaries here. You know, there was like state law that says uh, security deposits have to be returned in a timely fashion. Like, I don't know what timely is. We looked it up and we, we learned that timely, by definition, is 30 days. So we tightened it up. We made it three weeks. And uh, we also said, if you're not going to give someone a security deposit back, you have to give them an itemized list. Like, you can't just say, well, and like the list has to be something that is handed to you. So. I think the, the fact that we're having the discussion and we're, we're creating boundaries is really important. That's like, an, you know, it's not going to solve every problem but, and we'll keep tightening it up, but I think, you know, that, that's the kind of work that we can legislate and we can help with those unsavory landlords. And just to follow up on uh, my point from before, we had at the Landlord Tenant Relation Council last month a gentleman who came and said that he referenced the security deposit law and his landlord gave him back an extra 25% on top of what he was owed. So our law is helping people not have to go to court. I don't expect that to be the norm or to happen all the time, but it is progress and if there's other things that we can do, I think we'll absolutely do it. I don't think students always know about it too. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, Education is no the mm -hmm. hardest part. As a student who lives off campus, like I would six, uh, in my own apartment, one below me is four. My landlord's completely exploited this, and we're just like we know what's happening, and it's kind of sad. the landlord tenant relation council, please. Really? And you want to do so? Yeah, I'm going to so encourage sure. order from now on. We're gonna yeah. try to go in a line. So, um, Alexandria, you were kind of skipped over in the motion so if you'd like to say something as most millennials are i'm just kidding um so I've, I've actually lived in 17 apartments in new paltz alone since we've been here in 2003 and i have gotten like pretty much none of my um like literally i'm like laughing because it's ridiculous no security deposits back and the thing is i totally feel you even if you're here full time 12 months out of the year who has time like you know to to go to court plus it's scary you know like like it's, it's it's just it's stressful even when you're well versed you know in in all of it even when you're studying to go to law school like i was um trying to do for a long time even when you've um you know been involved in dyperg's consumer protection like project since day one it's still like the most terrifying confusing process and i still can't even tell you how to approach it you know um so yeah i agree so i think that landlords that um have a track record of screwing up in these ways shouldn't be allowed to continue that business like in, in a permitted process. I, 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 I hear some snaps. I know some people tuning in later on are probably going to be upset by this, but I, I really do think um, we need to start looking at that. Um, when I was evicted from that apartment in the village um, last year, you know, after dealing with 
human rights violations for months and, and really extreme harassment by the landlord. Um, the, the building, the, the apartment was condemned. Um, a month later, he was renting it to a business um, and he's making plenty of money, um, you know, and, and not having to, to deal with those problems at all. Um, so, because housing, housing is a basic right, you know, we have to remember that. And landlords, they're conducting business. They're making money off of us just living. Um, so I really do think, again, like, um, we should really look, I know time's almost up, but there's a lot of really cool stuff happening on the state level in terms of, you know, dealing with these issues, and I think we'll be able to kind of walk in that direction, too. Uh, Michelle, would you like to go next? Um, so you mentioned the, the, the be not to live here 10 months and then having to be, go home and then having to come back and um, I think what we need, I mean as a renter I have consistently lived out my last month on security because I knew my landlords were never going to give that money back and I know I've always kept the apartment in pristine condition maybe even better than when I first moved in and you know that's, I didn't always do that because I, I learned the hard way of not getting my security back so many times. Um, and I'm not recommending you do that either. I don't think that's legal, but um, <laughs> I, the, the, the key is that tenants don't have enough rights and we need to empower tenants and figure out ways and we need more communication and we need more people of the tenant landlord committees. We need, you know, televised and social media to expand all those rights, perhaps have somebody who could advocate for you if you're not here you know, during that time and, and you've been wronged as a tenant. Who can advocate for you in your place? Because maybe you live somewhere else that's not close and you're working and you can't come back. So I, I think those are ways that we can look into to helping those unique situations. Thank you. So uh, a couple of uh, points for the timekeeper. Uh, one of the things that we do in the village is we require uh, rental properties to be registered with the village. So you can contact the building department and find out if your particular property is registered with the village. If it's not, you can tell the building department to check it out and they can make sure that that, that property is registered. And then they have to follow the rules. They have to have inspections once a year. They have to have fire extinguishers. They have to have uh, you know all, all the safety uh, features that you would expect. Um, you yeah, know, this, this issue uh, has been a really active one for this village board. And I'm reminded by Barack Obama, when someone would bring an issue to him, he would say, make me, force me. And we have had one particular person, but we've had people come to several meetings and yell at us and call us names and really force this issue on us. And I, I wouldn't encourage you to yell at us, yell at us and call us names, but I would encourage you to, to come to meetings and advocate. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's because of some of that, that activist activity that, that we have the security deposit law. Um, but I, I think registering, uh, making sure your rental is registered is one of the things that can empower you best. And it's right there in the, in the rules. And if the landlord doesn't do it themselves, you can do it for them by contacting the building department. Um, I did hear one of the judges uh, say that, unfortunately, the tenants do need to be present when they bring these cases. I think our courts would be flexible in a timing issue if you had to be home in the summer to schedule a case for September. Uh, but you do need to be present for, if there's remediation, you got to be there sometimes. I'll just add to that, um, you don't actually need to call the building department to see if your property is registered. You just go on the village website. We, we provide the list right there. You can just see if your property is registered. And we're also uh, creating a way where you can use a, uh, a map and just roll over a property and it will give you details about the you know, that will that will be live momentarily. Our building department official has been working on that. He's on vacation. He'll be back next week. All right. Thank you. Oh, we have time for two more questions, maybe three if we push it. Yes. Hi. Um, hi again. Um, so I'm not too sure if everyone is familiar, but there was a recent case with ICE immigration where they um, came and they took uh, a member of the community who was undocumented um, and also was a business owner and who contribute a lot to the community. So I wanted to know um, what were your feelings or like what are the, 
What are your attitudes towards, you know, students and people who are undocumented currently living in New Paltz and how their rights can be protected essentially against um, landlords, um, against police brutality, and other issues as such? Who's up? Sorry. The order went out the window a long time ago. Michelle, would you like to start with this? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I, we need to protect all of our residents. It's very cut and dry for me there. I mean, as in Resisterhood, we have stood on corners and protested people being taken from our community, people who are great contributors, and even people who perhaps are not as contributing as Luis Martinez, who does a lot for our community, but every person in our community deserves to be here, period. I mean, we're a sanctuary city. We're, we, need, we need to just protect our residents. It's really that simple. They're here. When I was out petitioning, and now I can't remember his name. My name is, his name is uh, escaping from me, but he's your friend. Oh, Matthew. Yes, I met Matthew, and I was like, you're here. And so I was so happy to see him because we advocated for him to, and I know that that case isn't even over, and with even jo Joel Guerrero, who his case is still pending too. So it's really just us banding together and resisting these injustices and figuring out ways on how we can work together as a community. And I, and I believe that we have done a good job of that. Everyone on the board has done, and, and in the town as well. So just continuing that and not giving up. Thank you. And, uh, I agree. I do think our board has done a good job at focusing on this. I think Dan Torres on the town board has been a real instrumental leader on this. Uh, as, as three of my grandparents were first generation Americans, so I was raised hearing stories about the challenges they had with parents that spoke different languages. Uh, this is very important to me. I think uh, recently the town and village board started exploring the idea of municipal IDs. I think that's a good step that other communities have taken that we can do. I really wish the county would do it because that would really help more people, but if we have to step up and pay for it, I'm willing to help vote for that for sure. It's very important that we keep members of our community in our community. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm glad that this is coming up um, just because the more we talk about it, like in public forums, um, you know, the, the better it is for all of us as a community. Um, like hate has no home here and I think a lot of you know people um, who come at this issue from a hateful perspective also just like don't even get it um, like what it means to be undocumented because like everybody was at some point or their grandparents were or whatever you know um, so I'm loving the municipal IDs that have been popping up everywhere um, and I do appreciate the direct action that has been supported by our board um, on the village and town level um, but there could be some more advocacy um, done for that. Um, a very good friend of mine, um, this is up in Saugerties, but she went to SUNY New Paltz um, and was a Nyberg student also. Her husband, she's an, you know, a US citizen, her, and she's married to a husband. He was actually, um, he was kidnapped by ICE um, and deported, and he's been living in limbo um, because he was, uh, he was a refugee, he's stateless. Um, and, and that has been an unresolved issue in our county for, for over a year now. Um, and so it, it can get to that point. Of course, in the case of Luis Martinez, everybody band together, and, and that direct action at that final hour did have some major impact. Um, and, you know, in the case of my friend Matthew, you know, we really saw over, um, you know, over winter break even, um, you know, the activism that everybody band together, um, you know, to work on, uh, just keeping him safe um, was super clutch, but we need more of that. So New Pulse is, is really unique and it's, it's incredibly disheartening what's going on and the actions that ICE is taking. Um, so with Joel Guerrera, Matt Rojas, and Luis Martinez, there, there is a unique thread and, and um, in that because of our engaged and active community, their situations are probably a whole lot better than if they were in a community where their neighbors didn't know them. Um, so my kids are, are half Mexican, their mom's uh, family's from Mexico, so when Luis was, was abducted and brought to jail, the family was embarrassed. 
and like I'm very familiar with Mexican culture and that they generally want to keep things close to the vest and when um, Luis's family reached out to, to my ex-wife she called me immediately and I'm like we need to get this discussed publicly as soon as possible so you know I called Dan Torres who you know has been doing a lot of work on behalf of our community and you know that was the MO is that and you know the the gentleman who wrote the article in the chronogram, uh, Michael Frank. You know Dan and I met with him recently, and the, and that was how we respond to you know why did what what's going on differently in New Paltz, You know where you know there are people being abducted by ICE in other communities, but no one knows because the neighbors aren't aware, and you don't have the 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 community willing to go to you know Goshen and stand outside of a jail on a Sunday afternoon like you do here. Thank you very much, Don. When I went to the ICE regional office uh, as one of the protesters, um, I was struck by a sign that said, what about all the people who don't have a town behind them? What about all the forgotten people? You know, ICE, uh, I think there's never been a more apt acronym. It seems like that's what's running through their veins. Making America cruel again is not what we should be all about. Um, I'm very emotional about this issue. My, my father was an immigrant. My daughter, by marriage, is an immigrant and a person of color. Um, this is just unbelievable what's going on. I mean, and this is America. Um, so I think we just need to keep protesting. When, when uh, the, I guess it was the county sheriff's department tried to move our protest from the parking lot of the ICE headquarters, uh, I was there with a camera three feet from them filming, the, filming the, the, what they had to say. And when they moved us down the hill and tried to move us further out into the street, I filmed that as well. So I, I've been there. And, and all we can do is all we can do is fight, but we got to keep fighting. And, and, and it's it's probably one of the moral issues of our of our time. Um, we've got to take care of our brothers and sisters. This is it. I, I don't know what to say. It's it's, but I'm, I'm I'm there. You know, if there's a protest, make sure I know about it, and I'll be there. Thank you very much. Um, what do you feel uh, the pros and cons are for three-story buildings, four-story buildings, five-story buildings, and six-story buildings within New Paltz? Or within the village of Sneaking Tom, would you like to start? Sure. That's been a passionate debate over the past uh, couple of years. Um, and specifically, the, de the debate was with regard to the part of our community. It's called the NBR zone. It runs from Salvation Army up to BOCES on Route 32. And uh, I was strongly opposed, and am strongly opposed, to four-story buildings in that particular part of town uh, because there's no mass transit there. Um, and yeah, Dennis uh, has done a lot of work, and I've been helping him to some extent, on the issue of a floating zone, which would be limited to our downtown area, where the bus station is. And if a developer w were able to meet certain criteria, in my, in my book it's affordable housing, but for some people it's, green, it's lead building standards. Whatever the criteria might be, they have to meet some criteria, and if they do, the planning board can consider giving them a fourth story. But, and I, and I don't want to steal his, his line, but Dennis has said, we can't give that away for free. We've got to get that, we've got to get something in return for that. So if it's in our downtown business community where we have a bus station and mass transit, you know, I think we can consider four stories. But out in, you know, out on Route 32, where there just isn't ample room to have enough parking and there isn't mass transit, and there is an Empire State Trail coming through, and there's a you know there's a Stewart's moving there. It's just really not the right area for four stories. But there, there are parts, portions of our community where I think we should consider it. Um, yeah, intellectually, I'm comfortable with the idea of four stories if it's the right lot, if there's infrastructure, if there you know water and sewer infrastructure, if there's access to uh, transportation. Um, the, the NBR district that was being considered, there is, there is a building that's going to have four stories. It's under construction as we speak. I think that lot is unique because of its size and because of the parking it has on site. So, you know, I really feel like each lot needs to be looked at individually and then you can make unique decisions. Um, I, I'm worried about things like induced demand, you know, I, I understand the intellectual argument like add more supply and therefore that, um, that 
you know, allows for more housing. You know, I, I don't think that that's, I think there's several factors that need to be considered and nuanced decision making is really important when it comes to zoning, when it comes to planning board approvals. So there's not any one simple answer. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we have limited the number of stories in the NBR to three. Um, what, it's so interesting um, how so much of our life comes down to like planning and zoning, um, which is a, a realm that like you know no one knows about. Um, so as far as like different stories and whatnot, I, I think I kind of go along the same answer you know as everybody else. It depends on like you know where it, where it is and whatnot and um, how we're smart about it. But I do think it's important. Um, to always consider in these discussions because I've heard it overlooked when I was clerking constantly. Um, you know, the fact that it shouldn't be, is it a net zero building or is there affordable housing? We should be like thinking about how can we provide, you know, green affordable housing to our people and anywhere in the village, I would say, as like someone who walks and skates everywhere, um, you know, is, is very accessible um, to me. Um, and. You know, I, I really don't see any difference there. Um, so I think the emphasis shouldn't be on floors, but instead, you know, on achieving these other goals. Well, that was a nice segue out. Uh, it's, it's not just about one goal, you're right. right? And uh, as Don had mentioned, I've been working on designing an overlay zone. And I think I mentioned that in my opening statement as well. Our density has value to it. If we just blindly give away fourth story to developers, there's no guarantee that they're going to build anything with green building standards. There's no guarantee that rent's going to be affordable. If we can have an overlay zone where the fourth story and additional density is the uh, carrot that you receive in exchange for having more affordable housing and greener building standards or maybe supplying money towards our water and our waste water infrastructure needs then you can get the extra density. Rather than giving away that valuable density, we can use it so these projects don't burden taxpayers when uh, the infrastructure is needed to help support what's built. Our, our wastewater processing facility on rainy days is at max capacity right now. If we continue to expand in our community without addressing these infrastructure issues, what happens on those heavy, heavy rain days when we go beyond max capacity? tell you it's not good and it does not smell good. <laughs> right. So uh, our density is valuable. If we if we do it carefully and correctly, we can leverage that uh, that value that value into greener building standards, more affordable housing units and water to address our infrastructure needs or money to address our infrastructure needs. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you Dennis and what everyone has said can, can we wrap that infrastructure cost into the, what the developer is going to pay for if we do have a larger building? Um, there's a benefit to having four stories. It's cost effective for the developer. It creates more affordable housing. And we can you know, talk, have these initiatives where it's net zero energy usage. So we have a huge housing problem here in New Paltz, affordable housing. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of creating more affordable housing. And if that's one way to do it, that's something that can be looked at. Um, that being said, we're at three stories now, and I support staying at three stories. Um, I, don't, I don't believe there's many areas in our village that could handle four stories, but I do believe in looking at different districts that, to see if we can, on a case-by-case -case basis, to see if that would work in certain places. Um, and we also have zero place uh, that is four stories and going up. And I think we're gonna have we're gonna learn a lot once that is four stories and completed. There's a lot there, we're gonna learn a lot from how that looks, how that's going to function, and really use that as a model to drive our future decisions. All right, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, due to time, uh, we're going to move into clothing, closing statements. Uh, so Michelle, if you'd like to start with those. I'd, I'd like to ask everyone to remain strictly to two minutes for these. Thank you. Hold on. <laughs> um, okay. 
so um, women make up half the world, right? We also make up more than half of New Paltz. Women need to get elected at the state, local, and federal level because we have been far too long overlooked. We are undervalued and underpaid, this is fact. What is also fact that women bring a richness of intelligence that would benefit every venture. The more women's voices are heard, the better the world is. Studies have actually proven this, and when women are at the decision-making table, the more there is success. Right now, there is one woman on the village board, and that's Katie Tobin. I'd like to be at the table with her and Alex to increase that number, to increase the successes for our village, to properly reflect more than half of our community. Um, I lead with love, with the desire for more community empowerment. That's the name of my party, Com Community Empowerment Party. Um, with the best interest of our children, the students, young adults, single parents, those in the low income bracket, and seniors in mind. I am a 46-year-old single mother of twins. All of my work as an activist with Resisterhood, a wedding officiant, Reiki master, writer, editor, mother, involves listening and then delivering. These issues are all so important to me, and they include the environment, renters' rights, affordable housing, inclusivity, our civil liberties, our safety, and the desire to listen and work with one another, and for the youngest and the eldest members of our village. I hope to have your vote on May 7th. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I came to New Paltz as a student in 1997, and I never left because I love this place. Uh, being an elected official is not easy. I've been attacked for my beliefs. My family's been harassed because of my beliefs. And today's elected officials are on Colorado 24-7 thanks to social media. You know, I'm not running for office because I need a job or because I need a hobby. I'm running off for office because I'm passionate about this community and the people that live here, and I'm committed to making it the, the best place that it could be and being a progressive leader that New Paltz is and should always be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm always asking this very same question that Michelle touched on. Um, how can we affect change in the world when half of it, um, when only half of it is invited um, and only half of it feels welcome to even participate in the conversation. Um, so that's one reason why I'm asking for everyone's vote on May 7th, um, is, is to address that question. Um, you know, I hate labeling myself, but let me, you know, just put it out there. I'm a queer, pansexual, eco-feminist, survivor of gender-based violence, lifelong renter, who's only just starting to hopefully emerge from the cycle of poverty, and yet I have a proven track record of over 20 years of, you know, experience, skills, and service um, in the public interest. I've proven that I'm an ally, um, you know, for those who need allies, um, a grassroots leader that wins, you know, that helps ban fracking and flips districts. Um, you know, I'm a good listener. I'm better at listening than I am talking. Um, uh, and, and I am good at being a voice um, for those who no one else will listen to. And so voting for me on May 7th is, is voting uh, to include those traditionally left out of the decision-making decision processes that affect us all. It's voting for equity and justice. It's voting for that so-called American dream in which someone can be homeless one minute and then sitting at this very table um, with these awesome people the next. Um, so, you know, thanks so much for being here and for voting on May 7th. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really enjoy my job. I feel incredibly lucky that I get to serve this community and work on really interesting projects. I love trying to figure out how we pay for water and sewer and fire protection and pursue things like community choice aggregation so we can um, have the default uh, energy generation come from renewables so we can um, you know, hopefully break the, the cycle of being so dependent on fossil fuels. But um, you know, as I mentioned in, in my opening remarks, it's very easy to identify what we need to do and where we need to go. Uh, what's very difficult about this job is just being incredibly patient and relentless and you know, working with the bureaucracy, uh, engaging with officials in New York State, um, but but I, I love I love this job and I love this challenge and I feel fortunate that I get to uh, to represent uh, the folks in our community. Thank you very much. 
very much. Um, I have only one speed. It's forward. Uh, I run two companies. I'm a member of the Village Board. I just filmed uh, the 85th episode of a TV series called Slice of New Pulse. Uh, I interviewed a SUNY professor and the local priest and architect about the uh, fire at Notre Dame. Um, one of the companies I'm wearing the shirt of, um, I'm one of the inventors of a community drinking water system designed for remote communities in the developing world. It uses no fuel, no electricity, it runs by gravity. And we currently have brought clean drinking water for the first time to 250 people in Costa Rica and 150 people in Colombia. Uh, that's in my spare time. Um, I'm also a fighter. Uh, when my wife's and my home birth midwives were charged with practicing medicine without a license, um, they were facing the loss of their profession and even potentially jail. Uh, I formed an organization called Friends and Midwives. And the organization was over 70 people. I was the only man. Um, we worked with attorney Michael Sussman and successfully brought that case uh, to the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court, and uh, protected these women and allowed them to keep, uh, keep their practice. Um, on a lighter note, I'll tell you how I came to New Paltz because we were here visiting one Saturday morning. Town was dead, and there was one dude traveling down the middle of Main Street on a longboard wearing a cap and a hat hat. Honey, we're home. I love this place. <laughs> Thank you everyone very much for coming. Uh, thank you to all of our candidates for coming. Uh, Don Kerr, uh, Tim Rogers, Alexandria Warjik, Dennis Young, and Michelle Zip. Um, please go out and vote May 7th and April 30th. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great night. Uh